Thank you, gentlemen. That was extremely stimulating, intellectually, passionately provided with your articulate words and ideas that are necessary for us to grow in. Now, what I'd like to do next here is the next part is a provide a form for a rebuttal. So each each scholar will provide five minutes rebuttal, and then the real work begins with our dialogue after that. Dr. Wallace, the floor is yours. Guns. 
Guns have behaved more poorly and become evil. Guns themselves are the problem. The job of those of us who are 65 years, and I'm not at that age, by the way, uh, or older, is to rely on the fact that guns were more available and less controlled in years past. When there were far less mayhem, something else is the problem. Guns haven't changed. People have changed. Behavior is accepted from today's young people that was not accepted yesteryear. For those of us who are 65 years or older, assaults on teachers were not routine as they are in some cities. For example, Baltimore, an average of four teachers and staff members have been assaulted each school day in 20, 2010. And more than 300 staff members filed workers' compensation claims in a year because of injuries received through assaults or altercations on the job. Almost done. In Philadelphia, 690 teachers were assaulted in, in 2010. And in a five-year period, 4,000 were. In that city school, according to the Philadelphia Inquirer, on an average day, 25 students, teachers, or other staff members were beaten, robbed, sexually assaulted, or victims of other violent crimes. And that doesn't even include thousands more who were uh, extorted or threatened or bullied in the school year. Yale University scholar John Lott, who was the one that's actually challenging the, the uh, statistics by Adam Langford, argues that gun accessibility in our country has never been as restricted as it is now. Lott, Lott reports that until the 1960s, New York City public schools had shooting clubs. Students carried their rifles to school on the subway, and in the morning then turned them over to the homeroom teacher or a gym teacher. That was mainly kept to keep uh, and centrally controlled and out of the way. Rifles were retrieved after school for target practice. Virginia's rural areas were had a long tradition of high school students going hunting in the morning and before school. And they sometimes stored their guns in the trunks of their cars during the school day, parked on school grounds. During earlier periods, people, people could simply walk into a hardware store and buy a rifle. Buying a rifle or a pistol through a mail order catalog, such as Sears Roebuck and Company, was easy. Then a 12 or 14 birthday present was a shiny new 22 caliber rifle given to a boy by his father. Almost done. These facts of our history should con confront us with a question. With greater accessibility to guns in the past, why wasn't there this kind of violence we see today when there are so much more restricted guns, access to guns? There's another aspect of our response to mayhem. When a murderer uses a bomb, truck, or a car to kill people, we don't blame the bomb, the truck, or the car. We don't call for control of the instrument of death. We seem to focus fully recognize that such objects are inanimate and incapable of acting on their own. We, burn, we blame the perpetrator, last sentence. However, when a murder is gone, is done by using a gun, we do call for control over an inanimate instrument of death, the gun. I smell a hidden anti-gun agenda. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Thank you, William. Okay, so we're camping out on the gun issue for a moment, it looks like, uh, which is fine. Um, I welcome the conversation. Oftentimes, we look back with nostalgia at the past. We say, back when I was a kid, we didn't have all of this violence. Back when I was a kid, we had guns, or in other generations, we had guns and we didn't have all this violence. Well, let's talk about the difference between America now and America 60 years ago. Now, to be very frank, and this is no disrespect to Dr. Wallace, as a person of color, I have no interest in looking back at what America was like uh, 60 years ago and suggesting that in some way, shape, or form that we were better off then than we are now. In every way possible, I was denied access to housing. In every way possible, I was denied access to credit. In every way possible, I was denied access to education. So whatever America was in 1940 and 1950, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not interested in that past. But what I am interested in is how we move forward. And let me tell you how America's different even economically since then. The wealth gap in this country is increasing significantly. The country is twice as big as it was in 1950. We had about 150 million people in the country. Now we have about 300 million. The average CEO in 1965 made 25 times what their average worker made 
Today, they make 185 times more. Ladies and gentlemen, what you are seeing very clearly in this country is that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And so, yes, he is right in the sense that the guns are not necessarily the only reason for the violence, but the inequality and the poverty that we are comfortable with in this country is a huge reason for the violence. And if we don't deal with those issues, if we don't deal with them at their root, we will never fully do what we're trying to do on violence. And let me say this very clearly. In the meantime, in between time, as we are trying to figure this out, we need to make it less likely that people get guns in their hands. Do you realize that under the Trump administration, the president created, a, passed a law that made it easier for people with mental illnesses to get guns? He reversed Obama-era restrictions that stopped people with mental illnesses from getting guns? What on earth was he thinking? What on earth can we say makes the country better when more people have access? And the interesting thing about the murder rate in America, it's not, honestly, we're not the biggest problem, by the way, with guns. We oftentimes come to cities like Chicago and look at brown and black people and say, well, the guns, they're causing all the violence. Do you realize that two thirds of the deaths by handgun in this country are suicides? And those are predominantly not in communities of color, they are predominantly in white America. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm worried about that too. Guns make it easier for people to kill each other or themselves. A gun in your home is more likely to be used to kill someone in your family than it is to kill some intruder that we all are preparing for. Now, I don't take self-defense lightly. I do understand that people feel like they need to defend themselves. But the idea that every citizen would have a lethal weapon at their fingertips is frightening to me. Because America is increasingly stressed, increasingly dealing with inequality, increasingly dealing with xenophobia, increasingly dealing with racism, increasingly dealing with the pressures of this capitalist system. And you mean to tell me on top of that, given that also the opioid crisis and the, all the other drug use that we're having, that we ought to have guns at ease in our pockets as well? Does that just make sense? Logically, it makes no sense whatsoever. And so any effort to deal with violence has to start with guns. It doesn't end with guns, but it has to start with guns. Um, I could go on, but uh, Dr. Sweets, I think I'm going to reserve the rest of my time for the uh, in conversation and discussion. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's important that we look at the context of this issue. And oh, I'll say this lastly before I, I, I leave. When we look at the issue of comparative violence in the country, with the United States and other countries. There's no question that if you go to France, if you go to Great Britain, if you go to Canada, that they have less gun violence than we do. If you go to Japan, that's not even debatable at this point. And whether the numbers are off by 100,000 or a million or whatever they are, and I'm not suggesting to be light with numbers, but even let's say hypothetically that other countries do not report, which I actually agree with this statement. You mean to tell me we don't have a violent problem we have to deal with in this country? You mean to tell me that each one of you as an American is not at some point concerned with walking outside in a city like Chicago worried about gun violence? The truth of the matter is whether another country correctly or accurately gives their statistics does not, for me, impact what's happening every day in our streets. And we have to do everything we can to try to change that. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Plato in his Republic talks about the importance of democracy, but he also talks about its dangers. He says democracy is like a great beast that we have to watch, that we have to tame, we have to feed, we have to give it what it wants or what it thinks it wants, but keep it on a chain. Otherwise, it will not only consume its master, but it begin to consume itself. Uh, Hobbes talked about the importance of that as well with the Leviathan, being the average person. He doesn't really know what he's doing. And that's why basically I think we have the electoral college, at least that's a concept. And that denigrates the importance of the individual mindset behind that. You both have indicated the importance of engaging these issues and to thinking about them. But you have polarized in your positions, specifically on the issue of gun control. Now, an issue of um, 
liberal versus conservative. It is said that a liberal becomes a conservative when he is robbed. And a conservative becomes a liberal when he is misinformed, especially when the public is misinformed about him, when he is uh, taken to task for things he did not do. It's interesting how we shift our lives. Let's take the task of the issues of gun control versus on the table. <clears throat> Dr. Wallace. Yeah. Professor Ted mentioned the problem is not necessarily guns per se, or people with guns, but it's people using guns who are unstable. And that could happen to anyone who may actually be stable today and pass the test, but having that gun in the wrong hand at the wrong time, the consequences cannot be reversed. And I agree with, with that statement that we need to fear those folks who actually um, have, have guns and may be unstable. But it makes the argument that the only way you can defend yourself, when somebody, somebody walk into this room right now and start shooting, how do we defend ourselves? You want to call the police? By the time the police get here, we're all dead. So if somebody here has a gun, they can turn around and take that person out. So that's, so that's been part of the argument of, of, of gun ownership that we have the good guys with the guns who always take out the bad guys with the guns. And we have stories of stories of that when people actually do their job they're supposed to do. Not like the, the, the sheriffs in, in Florida, where they were actually there, but they hid for a while until the guy was done shooting everybody. Uh, there was a story, of, and I can't remember the name of the school, but it was here in Illinois, where there was a patrol officer that was there. Young guy came in with a gun, he was gonna shoot people up, he encountered the, the, the officer, and the officer took him out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think he makes, a, he makes a point. The problem is, is that the good guy with the gun scenario um, is more a tale of folklore than it is reality. Uh, we oftentimes suggest that in mass shootings, like the Aurora mass shooting or the Cap Columbine mass shooting, that if one person had a gun, they could have turned around in the middle of 400 people running towards the door screaming with a person with a semi-automatic weapon and you have a handgun, you could have flipped over, come under the, under the chair, moved in the dark in the Aurora situation, it was fully dark, as if you were James Bond, and you could have shot that person and taken them out. It's not realistic. Do you realize that the same day that the Sandy Hook massacre happened, that 20 people were stabbed in China the same day that 20 people were killed at Sandy Hook? What is the difference? You're always going to have people who are running around and do bad things to other people. These folks who were stabbed in China in a mass stabbing all lived. And the people at Sandy Hook all died. That's the difference. And so, yes, I mean, in that scenario, uh, would it be wonderful if the good guy with the gun scenario actually was uh, worked? Uh, absolutely. But let's, let's put our country in a situation where the bad guy who is unstable, the bad guy who has uh, these emotional issues that he's dealing with, if you look at the profile of mass shooters, uh, we see some similarities. Let's live in a country where they don't have easy access to military-grade weapons. I don't understand that. And so what I'm suggesting is, is that in the scenario in which we have everyone has easy access to weapons, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it does make sense for everybody to have a gun to protect themselves at some level. But can we go to a better country? Can we move towards a better scenario in which everyone does not have easy access to weapons? I think that's the America that I want to live in. I don't know about you. Can I read you? Of course. Well, the problem is to get to, get to that point. I mean, we already have a, Chicago has the most stringent gun control laws possible. And criminals don't go out and buy guns. They get guns, I mean, they don't go to the store and buy a gun, okay? They buy a gun that was stolen or, or, or someplace else. So criminals aren't going to obey the law. So many laws as you want to put, I mean, it's a placebo to think that somehow we're going to control criminals well, by trying to control the guns. I would suggest, though, that all the guns that come into Chicago are coming from Indiana, where you can go and buy very simply, you can straw purchase with no background check, 
barely an ID, walk in, buy as many guns as you want to, there are no metal detectors on the border. So maybe, just maybe, if we had comprehensive federal gun control laws, not a patchwork system of 50 different states and 50 different gun laws, maybe, just maybe, we could control the amount of guns we have in cities like Chicago. Maybe, just maybe, I'd like to have keep the Second Amendment and be able to protect my family the way I want to protect my family against the KKK and anybody who comes knocking on my door and wants to come inside my house. A gentleman. <laughs> I, I, for one, am grateful <laughs> that the security guards on this campus are former Chicago police officers or current police officers. For that, I'm grateful for that. Uh, we'll just have to do some stringent background tests before they even get to that point. Okay. Uh, let's go to the immigration. Let's talk about immigration. What is the most contentious issue on the table today? Of course, it's the wall, yeah. Donald Trump's wall. Let, let me just hop on this quickly. So we have this, obviously, so first of all, immigration has been down in this country since 2000. It's been decreasing steadily. Uh, it, it close to, in 2000, we had close to two million people coming across the border every year. Now we have less than half a million. So the, the decline has been going down. Donald Trump, on his very first day announcing he was going to run for president, said, and I quote, their, Mexico is not sending their best people. They're rapists, they're murderers, some I guess are good people. What he is doing and what he has done is used fear and xenophobia and this idea that these scary people are coming across the border to take your jobs and to rape your families and to kill you and steal your stuff and then say, vote for me, I will protect you. Do you realize that the biggest problem we have in illegal immigration is not at the border but at the airports? That we have more people that overstay their visa coming through the border, through the airports than we do people who are coming across the border illegally. So if he's worried about this, why do we focus on this issue? Why don't we go where the real problem is and deal with it that way? And here's why. In America, we have a very pernicious, sad history of racial um, selection when it comes to people who come across the border. Before 1951, you could not become a US citizen unless you could prove in a court of law you were white. That's just the reality. So let's call a spade a spade, if you will. The fact of the matter is, is that we want, and Donald Trump has said this himself, he wants immigration from Sweden. He wants immigration from Europe. He doesn't want it from asshole countries like in Central and South America or like in Africa. And so I'm for, obviously, people coming across the border legally. Duh, we all, I don't believe it. Who's, who's not for legal immigration at some level? The question is, what do we do about it? And the question is, do we use racism as a target or as a, uh, as a tool to deal with this issue? And I think it's crazy that we're doing that. Let's deal with the real issue. Dr. Wallace? Well, look, before Donald Trump, and I'm not here to be a, an apologist for Donald Trump. I don't, I don't agree with everything Donald Trump says or does, and I don't think anybody in here, as you said, you're not a partisan. You're not you know, uh, taking a Democrat side, Republican side. On this, on this particular issue, though, you can talk about, people have been talking about this issue for decades. Ronald Reagan talked about it. I, I thought I had the, um, the account of what uh, Bill Clinton said in his, his uh, State of the Union address, but it, it, but it looks like I don't have it here. I was like, actually going to quote him, because he basically says this is an issue, and this is a problem. Obama was the, um, uh, what do they call him, the, um, shoot, uh, what does it do when you export people back? Border. Deporter in chief. chief. Yeah, yeah deporter in chief. Mm -hmm. He deported more folks. It was like a thousand people a, a month or yeah. a week or something. He was he was deporting a lot of folks all the time. So it's not just something that that uh, that Donald Trump is 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 uh, upset about. Like I said, I mentioned the Secure Fence Act of 2006. He had Democrats who signed this. They were supposed to put up a fence. I don't know what happened to it, but I actually have the the act here in my hand. I'm not going to read. I'm going to spare you. I'm not going to read it to you. But the whole idea was they were going to put a, war, a, a fence up to keep people from crossing the border. Now, you have to be able to secure your borders. And one of the things they, they want to talk about, and I think we would agree on this, that we do want to have immigration reform. That something needs to happen different the way people become US citizens, OK, a, a special track. But you have one of the things that they want to do is stop people from running across the border. Because if you try to do the other first, people are going to continue to come. And so they want to stop the inflow of people coming across the border. Then they're supposedly going to look at trying to fix the immigration problem that everybody agrees we have. Um, and then hopefully that it, it'll then work. But, uh, but as I said in my speech, I said we need to be looking at all our ports of entry. 
It's not because people can fly over that fence. I understand that. Or they can go under it. <laughs> but here's what I'm, I'm sorry. And I'm not sure how deep they're actually making the fences. Right. So if they make them deep enough, maybe that'll help cut down some of the tunnels. But you know. Well, here's, here's a challenge I have with the current conservative ideology on crime and illegality. Conservatives want to deal with the problem at the symptom, if you will, and not at the source or the root. Have we ever asked the question why so many people are trying to get in this country? Have you ever just stopped and asked that question? What are they coming for? Well, let's think about it. First of all, America likes cheap and free labor. That's the bottom line. So maybe if you prosecuted the companies that were hiring people illegally and not giving them full minimum wage, maybe, just maybe, the demand for the labor would dry up and people would not come. That's number one. Number two, if you think about the migrant crisis coming across the border from countries like Honduras, Guatemala, if you just take a moment to look back in history, the United States policies during the Cold War created much of the crisis that you see in these countries right now. The Guatemalan refugees who are coming across the border are running from the violence that has existed through a 36-year civil war that was created because the CIA basically usurped and overthrew their government so that the United Fruit Company, an American company, could have access to their land. Therefore, we stole their resources, ripped them of their land, created chaos in the streets, created crime. Now we're mad at them because they've run away from the country and try to come here. It's the same thing we do with urban communities. We blame these gang members, which God knows I don't, I don't uh, justify or validate anybody committing crime. But have you ever stopped to think why so many people in our communities are in gangs? Have you ever stopped to think why there's so much crime and violence in a community like Inglewood? Because until we do that, we're only going to police by slapping on the hand at the tail end, and we'll never get to the source, we'll never get to the root, and we'll never actually solve the problem. So what is this root? I would suggest inequality in America, the crime issue, is directly related to the issue of inequality. Now, I will agree with uh, Reverend Dr. Wallace here on the uh, moral decay of this country in certain ways. I actually, we agree very heavily on this. However, I would suggest that when you look at the role that the government can play, the government in this country has exploited workers historically for years. The government in this country has turned a blind eye when capitalists have done all kinds of egregious sins and violations, not paying people, allowing them to die. There's this book called uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair that showed in the early 1900s what happened in the Chicago meatpacking industry when the government did not regulate them. So what I'm saying is this. Then you look at redlining, and you look at the lack of loans that were given to African American people, and white flight in these communities, and lack of investment in schools, and the easy access to guns, and drugs being dropped into the community, and you have a perfect storm for violence. So it's the same violence, by the way, you would see in, say, the Middle East and the Palestinian community, where people are disconnected from opportunities and resources. They join gangs, they join terrorist organizations. Our kids do the same things. We gotta deal with crime resources. I think the question on that, actually, on the point of that source issue. If the source of problems within human nature, on a philosophical perspective, is this environmental atmospheric problem of the, the, that creates the situation from which these inequalities stem, such as racism, such as problems with uh, lack of school funding, uh, problems with the, uh, the environment, um, uh, food, etc., creates this type of uh, situation. If that's the case, then the environment creates these types of um, uh, problems. Would you say the same thing then about the creation of George W. Bush, the creation of Dick Cheney, the creation of um, Woody Madoff, they also have problems, but they come from an environment as well. So we should blame the environment for their, for what's happening, what they've done. I don't understand. Uh, that's the political environment from which they've come, the sociological environment from which they grew up, the people they surround themselves with, created that individual. So would you say the same thing about them? Are you suggesting, are you speaking to criminal acts? That they uh, are so would, of, yes, I would claim. Are you suggesting, are you asking me whether their environment caused their criminality? Yes. Um, I would suggest that human nature causes people to oftentimes do things that are immoral. I'm not talking about whether we live in a utopian society where everyone lives in a way where they're not committing crimes. I'm talking about how do we mitigate and how do we lessen the amount of crime and violence that we have. 
it is very clear to me that every community does not look like Ewood. It's clear to me that every country doesn't look like America. Somebody has figured this out. You know in Japan, that they have a very minimal amount of gun violence in Japan? Are Japanese people more moral than us? Are Japanese people more kind than us? Or maybe, just maybe, that they have a government and a culture that has different values. And I'm suggesting, ladies and gentlemen, you're always going to have people who are doing the wrong thing. But let's make it so that it is harder for the level of violence and the level of inequality that exists in this country. And I'm going to tell you this very clearly. This is not utopian. It's happening all over the world. We just need to wake up and start doing it. Okay. Wallace? Where do I start? Well, what I was trying to touch on is the major distinction between the liberal and the conservative viewpoint on, on some issues. One focuses on the, um, the predominance of choice, and the other focuses on the, the environmental issues. Both of them are important in determining and creating the people that we are. There's, there's just a different focus on them in, in discussions. I don't understand, but one of the things when we talk about crimes, and I, and I think we've talked about this before, it just hasn't been brought up here. One of the things that, that people don't want to talk about is the absence of fathers in the black community. A lot of people go to gangs because there's no male figure to stand up for them when the gangs come around and try to say, hey, you come join with us and we'll take care of you. I would have never let my sons, they would have had to go through me to get to my, I have two boys, they have two boys. They're in their 30s now. But they would have had to come through me to get to my son. They're not going to touch my sons. They're not joining the gang, and that's the way it is. You have to deal with me. And in some of these communities, we've got a lot of uh, out of wedlock. Um, and I'm not trying to beat up on, on single parent house, household. Please understand. I'm a minister of the gospel. I know that some, you know, there are certain reasons. Sometimes have women have children out of wedlock. Sometimes that you know they they do have a husband. The husband goes off the war and gets killed or gets killed on the job. But you have to have the male and the female in the home to bring these kids up right. Now, it doesn't mean that they're always going to grow up right. There's a lot of people who have, have um, their two-parent households and are rich kids, and they're so spoiled that they don't know how to behave. Uh, but generally speaking, having the man and the woman in the home will help cut out some of that stuff, and then having communities decide that they're gonna, not going to allow this crap to happen in their, in, in, in their neighborhood and not being afraid to go ahead and, and say that there's a crack house over there selling crack. And we need to get rid of it. We need to get, and it, it, it also includes, um, I must talk about my, my comrades in ministry. Those pastors who aren't doing, uh, <laughs> who aren't doing anything. You come to Sunday and all it is about praise God, praise God, and you go out and, and they're not in the streets. They're not talking to people. They're not trying to really change people's life. It's all about the money. It's all about having your best life now. And, and we've got, I'm sorry, we've got churches on every single street. The, the significant issues. Let's talk about the Me Too movement. The APA just released the American Psychological Association in the DSM manual about toxic masculinity. Masculinity in general, specifically traditional masculinity being dangerous for boys. Uh, and many have taken this to store, I've taken a store on this issue in college and many uh, political as well as sociological issues are going to come forth from that. Let's talk about the Me Too issue and the masculinity. If I, if I may, yeah, if you, if you just humor me for just 30 seconds. I just want to respond to the issue of the fathers. I think it's ties to masculinity. Yeah. Um, I agree with him fully on the idea of, uh, I have a son, I have two daughters. Um, and what has happened, African Americans, 70% of our kids uh, grow up without a father in the home. But without looking at public policy, we don't know why. Is it just that people of color don't like to stay together? Is it that people of color are sexually irresponsible? If we don't have a understanding of public policy, then we assume those things. Literally, slavery and Jim Crow segregation have had a deleterious <coughs> impact on the African American family. No, 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 no. Actually, it, it has. It has not. It has. It has not. Now, I, now, I know where you're going on this, uh, <laughs> Dr. Wallace. You're going to say that during slavery that we had more firmer, uh, firmer family structure. In the early 1900s, we had a firmer, firmer family structure. You are correct. However, 19, up to 1940. How, it wasn't until the 1960s. Uh, okay. Absolutely. However, okay. living under the threat of domestic terrorism, you're telling me for hundreds of years, has no impact on the black family? 
you suggesting to me that the roles in the females and males have not been impacted significantly by the hatred that this country has consistently put African Americans through? You paint and with so broad a brush, my brother. Well, you I'm telling you, there's, there, I'm sure there's some families that is <laughs> devastated, but there are other families. We even started cities okay. and towns and villages of our own. And so I, I agree with that, but how are you going to tell me? Okay. We're going I, back to no, the no, no, but let me, let me finish my public policy yeah. point. <laughs> but how are you going to tell me that when my wife can be sold, I can have a stable family? They went and they found their spouses after slavery. You have countless stories of people. I just finished reading, and I can't remember the name of the woman. At, at that I just finished reading the story. Go back and read some of the slave stories. After slavery was over, they went back and they found their children. They found their spouses. Yes, they did. So I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll move off. We'll move off. Let me just say this quickly. I'll say this in 30 seconds, I promise. No fault divorce laws, war on drugs, mass incarceration, et cetera, those also had an impact on the African American family in the last 50 years, and those things that we have to look at as well. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about the need to believe for a little bit. Uh, many women have been coming forward, politicians have fallen, ministers have fallen, TV personalities have fallen, TV shows have removed major characters that could impact the entire season. Millions of dollars could be impacted by, by the acts of certain individuals who are in power. Certain women out of their own bravery. Maybe for the cost of much, I stepped back and spoke up, which called it the Me Too. It happened to Me Too. The problem is how you regulate that, right? Uh, anybody who touches you the wrong way is equivalent to another person who rapes you. How do you, and what's the regulation, and are you guilty to put it innocent? Do we believe the woman first? And any thoughts on this issue of, as you? Yeah, as, as I said in my statement, yes. we still have to uphold the law. Now, if we need to make some changes to the law, we need to make changes to the law. But we need to look at it based on trying to, say that the person is innocent until proven guilty. Um, but we may, you know, the, with our society and some of our mores which have changed and allowing women to be more, allowing men and women to be more sexually active and, and so forth, there, it is hard. I'm glad I'm not, I'm not um, 